felt good, felt really good. Um, so I want to introduce myself a little bit and talk also a bit about what the heck it is that I do. Um, so I am David Ortnell. I'm a principal program manager at Microsoft working on .NET. Um, so for the past five years, that has been my life of uh, trying to help customers use Xamarin uh, for Android, iOS, Mac OS development, use Xamarin Forms for cross-platform development. And uh, more recently, uh, we are now part of .NET, uh, not just organizationally, but our SDKs and everything are all brought together. So we have a much broader interest now in the whole .NET ecosystem. So that's ASP.NET, that's Blazor, that's console, that's CLI experiences, that's Visual Studio Code, um, and of course, Visual Studio itself. So um, I spent a lot of time talking to customers, finding out what are you building and what are your current pain points and you know, what are you struggling with? And it's not just, hey, uh, I have a bug, but it's how can we hire developers? It's recruiting. Uh, it's, hey, I've got a team over here doing JavaScript and Angular, and then I have a team over here doing uh, XAML. How do we get these teams to work together? Um, or how do I get my app most quickly to market? Um, I mean, all, the, whole, the whole gamut, right? It's not just technology itself, but it's how does it fit into your business and how does it help your business uh, succeed in whatever way that, what that means to your business. So for me, that's very uh, exciting because for, I don't know, 10 plus years, I had my own business doing consulting um, and I had a business partner and we had lots of customers and then we didn't have any customers. And, uh, you know, I've worked in enterprise, I've worked in healthcare, you know, being in St. Louis, of course, I've done projects for Monsanto, which is now, I guess, Bayer. That happened after I exited the scene. Um, and, uh, you know, all, all across the board. So now I'm in a position where I can help uh, much smarter than me engineers and program managers um, help make good decisions for our products so that the next release and the next release and the next release for the next five, 10 years is actually useful to you. Um, and is aligning with your business strategies because, uh, you know, really you as customers are leading us in many ways. I mean, we're certainly looking for opportunities to innovate on your behalf, uh, but we're, I'm not up here to sell you on something. Everything that we're building now came directly from customers like you saying, here are our actual needs. Um, please do these things. And of course, you know, we look across the spectrum of customers and say, what, what, what are you as developers needing? Um, and it's not always the same, right? Uh, have you ever uh, heard yourself say, or heard somebody, more likely somebody else said this, you wouldn't have said this yourself, but I can't believe that they won't do X, you know, fill in the blank. It's like, it's so obvious, why won't they do that? And you know, the reality is, is that, yeah, I get that that's super important to you and it seems super obvious to you, but in the grand scheme of things, and we have to take the grand scheme into account, we're not necessarily gonna do those things. So today I'm here to talk to you about client app development. Um, and I'm gonna be talking about it in many ways from the perspective of, of what does it mean for your business? Um, and we'll get into some uh, code. Um, we're gonna look at some code. Unfortunately, we're not going to be running that code because I got greedy this morning. I got so greedy that I was like, you know what? We got some really cool new stuff that just landed, just landed and hot bits, and I'm gonna install it. Yeah, right? Should have known better. It's been a long time since I've had to actually use these things, these laptops. I've got a nice workhorse Dell at, at, at home with my nice multi-screen setup and my camera on the arm and the lighting and the LEDs behind me. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, I won't be able to show you all the end-to-end -end stuff. However, we do have an event coming up um, this Friday it's being hosted out in Europe somewhere, just the Western Central Europe time zone. Um, but I will be giving a presentation at like 8.45 in the morning our time. Uh, it is the Xamarin Expert Day, and we will focus not only on Xamarin, but .NET uh, 6. Uh, I am not alone, thankfully. So this is a, a slide that I guess you don't often see from teams at big companies like Microsoft, but these are actual people. You can actually talk to them and they want to talk to you about what you are uh, needing and what you're dealing with, whether it's a wish, a pipe dream, uh, or just massive pain. So in purple, I kind of put 
here are the general areas of client app development that these folks uh, know something about and or are responsible for. There's a lot of overlap in our teams. We collaborate a ton, um, but pretty much for me, anything that is Maui SDKs, Xamarin SDKs, so the Android, iOS, Mac OS, Windows, actual toolkits that you're using, I can help you with those things. Uh, general product roadmap strategy, I can help you with those things. Um, and then Dimitri, Hot Reload, XAML, he has a long history on the Windows platform side of things, so uh, he's a ton of help there. Maddie Legere, uh, she's getting married, so don't bother her. Uh, Jake, she'll be back in a month for .NET Comp. Uh, Jake, one of the, I think he is the newest member on the team, um, but anything around uh, Visual Studio productivity, the single project experience, which I'll show you in a little bit. Uh, getting started, educational materials, he's a good help there. Chris Hardy is our boss, so we don't really know what he does, um, except for have one-on-ones with us. Uh, hi, Chris, if you're watching. Uh, Olia Gavrish uh, is more on the WPF WinForms side. Anybody here doing WPF WinForms? Yeah, say it well, you know, hey, it's still supported in .NET 6. Uh, if it works, it works, right? Um, who is doing ASP.NET? Okay, what is everybody else doing? Well, you're a recruiter. You're doing what? You're doing some ASP.NET Core? Anybody doing Blazor, touch Blazor? Okay, a couple Blazor touches. Um, oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Um, what about, yeah, because I remember the that meeting at that uh, restaurant in the Valley where Kevin was all, it's the next Silverlight. <laughs> Nothing is the next Silverlight, just settle down. Um, <laughs> Uh, what about Xamarin? Anybody doing Xamarin? Okay. So the rest of you just sit around and collect paychecks. JavaScript, Angular, React. Okay. Native mobile, Swift, Objective-C, Java. JP just keeps nodding. Yes, we do all those things. Oh, well, you know what? They're all extensions of you at this point. You're a business owner. Um, and then Zoran. I... I didn't mention what Zoren does, but uh, XAML experiences. So uh, really anything around uh, IDE, IntelliSense, how are you using XAML, what controls are you using, are you using the data binding uh, tools, um, all kinds of stuff. Now the good news is, is that uh, .NET is doing super well and you can build pretty much anything with .NET. Um, so you can learn one language, one base class library, and you can expect in .NET 6, that all of that is going to be consistent no matter what device or platform you're targeting. And that's pretty cool. That It took us quite a while to actually get to this place. Um, in pr prior to .NET 6, if you were building a, uh, a mobile app and then building a desktop app, you could run into a situation where something in .NET didn't behave the same way that you expected because the mono runtime used a different base class than the .NET runtime base class. Um, and so you run into those situations. Uh, that's perhaps not something you hit on a regular basis, but it's nice to know that uh, you now have that consistency in terms of the API that you are working against. As a developer, that is kind of your contract, right, with the toolkit that you've chosen. Um, can I do the things I should be able to do regardless of whether it's a website, a desktop app, a mobile app, et cetera. Um, and so today we're going to focus, of course, on uh, desktop and mobile. Uh, I'll touch a little bit on web as well because uh, it is a client app technology. Uh, in terms of .NET itself, you may have seen these numbers. Does anybody uh, watch the build uh, keynotes from Microsoft? Okay, so this is new information to a lot of people. That's great. I mean, because part of me was like, well, I'll put this stuff in here, but we kind of trot these numbers out every time we give a big keynote or something. So if this is news to you, that's fantastic. Um, greater than 5 million .NET developers uh, in 2019, 2020 uh, on Stack Overflow surveys, NetCore, was the number one most loved framework, which is pretty cool. Um, Xamarin, on the other hand, is on the other end of that list. And so, I mean, that, that's just the way it is. And so we ask ourselves the question, well, why is that? Uh, it's not because we don't share enough monkeys with people, because we have awesome plush monkeys. It's not because we didn't have a great logo. We had a fantastic logo. It's because we knew that we needed to work on some core .NET fundamentals. And that's what we're doing in .NET 6. So we're really excited about that. Um, Obviously, other great numbers up here. The performance against Node is fantastic. 
Um, we're doing some really cool things right now where we're benchmarking our Blazor hybrid scenarios against Electron, and uh, it's looking really, really good. So very excited to start to share those numbers, both just general runtime performance, app size, um, but memory allocation, super low. Um, so that's pretty exciting. So we'll see if we can't convince that uh, little app called Microsoft Teams to at some point take a bet on .NET again. Um, and then in terms of just overall performance, these are .NET 5 performance improvements. Um, if you hear terms like .NET Core, .NET Framework, uh, and then now everything is just .NET 5, .NET 6, we're really trying to simplify the whole platform so that it's really easy to understand what it is you're using. Uh, there aren't these different flavors and varieties, and you don't have to worry about what's mono and what's not. Uh, it's all just .NET now, and you can have the, the confidence to use it because it's all the same. Um, and there is a blog post from uh, Stephen Tobe on the .NET team for .NET 6 performance. Um, it continues this trend right here, which is very exciting. Um, so they are eking out every millisecond, every byte they possibly can to improve things. Adoption overall, if we look at what happened from .NET Core to .NET 5, very rapid six month adoption, so that's great. People are jumping on board. Uh, you know, we're still trying to shake the whole Microsoft isn't friendly to open source, even though we're the largest open source maintainer uh, in the world. Um, not just because we have GitHub, um, but also very cool things happening with GitHub. I mean, every time I check that thing out, it's like there's a new button there that does exactly what I want it to do. Like I was copying code snippets today. I was copying raw content off of a, of a file. It's sweet. Um, so we're looking for the same adoption, of course, in .NET 6. Uh, and this really just all goes to show that there is uh, growing and increased confidence in the platform. .NET's been around now. Uh, this coming February will be 20 years. And that's pretty solid. And we continue to innovate. Um, so let's talk. Sorry. No? Yes. OK. Sorry. I thought, I thought there, it's been so long since I've been in person that like, I heard a noise. I was like, oh, someone wants to talk to me. Um, so I want to uh, clarify what I mean in this context in this presentation by client app. So I'm going to be talking about desktop apps for Windows and Mac OS. I know that there's a Linux out there. Um, love Linux. Hope that we can support Linux in terms of client apps soon within a few years. Um, the reality is, is that we talk to customers and it's one of those scenarios of, I can't believe you don't do this. And it's like, man, we're trying to justify it. I swear we're trying to justify it. But you know, you've got a budget and we're gonna spend it where we're gonna get the bang for the buck. I mean, there is an opportunity. Linux as a developer platform as well as a target platform is growing. Um, so it's not a wasted effort, but uh, we need to make sure that year after year we, we have uh, our expenses in the right places so that we keep the customers we have healthy and happy. Um, of course, web, all browsers, just, they all work, right? They always work the same, the way browsers work. Um, and then Android and iOS. I know there's a Ubuntu out there somewhere on somebody's handset, um, but we're gonna primarily focus on those two. Android is like, what, 78% of the market at this point, and uh, iOS is 12. So anything Linux-based is, well behind both of those. Um, but the interesting thing is, is even though iOS is such a small segment, um, I mean, it gets all the love, doesn't it? I mean, it really does. But we focus on the developer productivity around Android in particular because it is such a huge part of the market globally. Um, so you, you see that in our tools, you see that in our demos. So this leads us to the question, if we want to build for these things, not every project is equal. You're not always going to target every single one of them, but you know it's nice sometimes to be able to say, we're gonna target more than one of them, um, or at least have the opportunity to share code to get to another one. Um, and so this is a bit of the hypothetical, or not necessarily hypothetical, but the, you, you may never need it, but you just wanna know that you could check that box if you ever had to. And we don't really build for that. We don't just add platforms just so that people can check the box if they ever had to. Um, we are open source, and so if people want to add a platform for, say, Tizen, which is Samsung's platform, they are more than welcome to, and they have. And thankfully, they support it with a great team of engineers. Uh, Linux, we have the same opportunity, and there has been no Samsung to step up and be like, hey, we're going to help you get Linux out there. So 
when you're looking at this, how do you choose the next project? And I find this just to be a, a really fascinating question to ponder uh, because I've had to face this many times in my own career uh, as a business owner and as a developer. Where is my, where's my next job going to be? Where's the next project going to be? How do I advise my customers um, on what I'm basically going to sell them? Because if they're not happy with it, they might pay me, but they'll never come back to the next project. So I think the good news from my perspective is that .NET is the answer. Um, but within .NET, there are some choices to be made, right? So within .NET, you've got, um, you know, I, I threw together some, some matrices um, like this. So down the left-hand side, you've got MAUI, MAUI Blazor, Blazor itself, ASP.NET. I'm not going to mention web forms. I'm assuming that everybody knows what a web form is. Um, but Windows App SDK, does anybody know what that is? That's the, that's the latest and greatest Windows platform. So this is WinUI 3-based stuff. Uh, Project Reunion is what it was called for a hot moment, um, but it's now officially called the Windows App SDK. This gives you the ability to write one Windows platform code project, uh, and it will run both sandboxed on the Windows 10 as well as uh, unpackaged. Um, so um, once you get into the Windows side of all those things, it starts to be very complicated. So I'll stop using buzzwords at this point. Um, and then you've also got web win forms and, and WPF. I mean, they exist. We still support them in .NET 6. Should you use them? Should you not use them? Are you running out of runway with them? Yeah, you know, depends on what you're building, right? Like if you're just building a little input thing for a utility that is only ever going to be used on a Windows machine and you have no budget to do it, you just need something that you can go click a button and put in a number to do a thing. Sure, go, go nuts with win forms. Yeah, why not? You're never going to put it on a Mac. You don't care, you, you, maybe you want it to run on a really old version of Windows, that's great. Um, should you start your next big project with WinForms? I hope, I hope you'll consider not. Um, I hope you'll consider Maui, which uh, we'll get to here in a bit. But you look at this and you're like, okay, do I care that .NET Maui Blazor covers the broadest spectrum of these platforms that in this context we care about? Now, uh, like I said, it doesn't cover Linux. There are all these other caveats. And there are other, op other open source projects out there too. Uh, if, you, if you care to go check them out and use them, you're more than happy to. I'm only gonna focus on the stuff that we own and maintain. No, no, uh, no shade to them. They're all, they're all fantastic. Check them out. They all use .NET. Um, but you know, if you only need one platform, which one should you use? If you need multiple, which one should you use? What's the difference between a Maui Blazor app and a Maui app? Where does the where is the cliff, right? We're always wondering, okay, I can get this far. The first 80% is super great, but the last 20% of that project is going to be hell. Is it? What does a hell look like? I mean, maybe, you're, maybe you have a developer who knows that hell really, really well, and you can cover that last 20%. Um, so... These are the kinds of things that I think a lot of companies consider. These are certainly the kinds of things that I considered. Um, and then you know you look at, okay, if I choose one of those, what do I need from a skill standpoint, from an education standpoint? Do I have C Sharp developers? Do I have JavaScript developers? Do I personally, as a developer, want to use JavaScript? Maybe, maybe not. I've used plenty of JavaScript. I used CoffeeScript. Is CoffeeScript still a thing? Okay. Uh, and I, I've unfortunately never had the joy of TypeScript. Um, I wanted to, but it was super new the last time that I had a project that could have used it. Um, so you look across these things, and I hear this from customers all the time. They're like, okay, uh, yeah, the platform looks great. The features look great. It'll do everything we want to do, but can I hire teams? I need to, I need to scale up by two, three teams. Can I do that if I choose .NET? Um, and we want to be able to say, and we do say, yes. Because if you know how to use .NET, because it's a consistent BCL, it's a consistent runtime experience, our Visual Studio tools are the same no matter what you're targeting, then therefore you should be able to retrofit and or scale up your teams, or upskill, I guess is the phrase that is used often now, um, to, do, to do these platforms and to do uh, what they need to do regardless. So uh, the, the off color check marks are, hey, these things are optional. Um, and I thought it would be fun to do that because a lot of people see .NET MAUI and they think um, it's Xamarin forms and so therefore you must use XAML. And that's actually not true at all. XAML is completely optional. When Xamarin forms was first created, there was no XAML for it. XAML was added shortly after. 
Um, it was uh, in early development, but the first version of it was a nice fluent syntax all in C-sharp. And you can still do that today, and we have plenty of customers that do that as well with very large apps. So you don't have to use XAML. And there are some reasons you might not want to use XAML. Um, for the most part, uh, it's going to perform the same as if you have C-sharp only, but uh, your app may be more linker friendly, so you can get a smaller app size marginally. Uh, if you're going to eke out absolutely every bit of performance, then C-sharp will, will be there for you. Um, what other criteria do you consider? Testability, popularity, uh, education resources, all these sorts of things. Fill in the blank. Um, does anybody have other things that you consider when you're evaluating solutions? Okay, yeah. So who's, who's running the show? Are they going to be around? Are they going to bail on it? I get that question all the time. Well, actually, the question I used to get is, is Microsoft going to kill Xamarin? I used to get that all the time. Um, and it's like, well, they just paid a hefty sum for it. So I'm going to say not yet. Um, and of course, you know, they haven't. And now we're at the point where Xamarin is now basically absorbed and is part of .NET. It's a key core framework workload uh, to throw out some other terms. We call it a workload. VS has their own version of workloads. Um, that's one thing you do learn when you come join a company like Microsoft. Um, when you go across organizational boundaries and you have conversations with other teams, uh, the, the word that you think you know what it means doesn't mean the same thing to that team. Like I was talking, uh, shortly after I joined Microsoft, I had a meeting with the Windows team and they kept talking about XAML this and XAML that and XAML controls. And I'm like, hang on a second, XAML is just an XML format. What do you, why is everything called XAML? And I mean, they had a long history of this is how they named things. And uh, I came to realize I need to understand what they mean when they say these things, because I can't assume we're going to have a lot of misunderstandings. Um, and then when I explained how we use XAML, they're like, oh, oh, that's not how we do it at all. Yeah. And this is why we have uh, mis misconceptions. Um, other things that you consider when you're looking at technologies, languages? No. I covered it all. I'm super thorough. Huh? Licensing costs. Licensing. Yeah, absolutely. What's it going to cost you? Not just uh, to use it straight up, but support. You know, we offer support. Actually, uh, I guess, I mean, this is probably sad to enlighten people on now, but Xamarin had free support for years. And very few people actually took advantage of it. Um, but it, yeah, we had like four, five support engineers just sitting there like, we're ready to go. Tell us what you need. Um, yeah, but we, you know, then we have paid support and what's that going to cost you? And what's a Visual Studio Enterprise license going to cost you? Because, um, you, maybe you want the profiler because you want to get that best performance you possibly can. Um, yeah. So what can we do to simplify this from a product standpoint, which is what I mostly can influence? Um, I want to make sure that oh, I just totally smacked the microphone. I hope everybody's okay. Um, I, I want to make sure that I uh, help make the product actually the, the best option for for everybody. Um, but the you know the reality is is that I'm not going to convince a JavaScript only shop to use .NET MAUI. The, the likelihood of them jumping from React web based JavaScript stuff with no .NET experience to a .NET based solution is pretty slim. That's just the reality of it. Um, so I you know I'm, and, and that's fine you know. That's one of the cool things about working in Microsoft at this current day and age. Uh, we, you see our own teams using React and JS. Um, and they're, but the thing is, they're not only using that, right? They're using it with a mix of .NET, with a mix of C, C++, um, and, and a mix of uh, Swift, Objective-C, Kotlin, and Java, just depending. Um, you know, there is some standardization that happens across teams, of course, but um, for the most part, we're allowed to and we're encouraged to use the best tools for the job that we're doing. Uh, not just pedal.net to our internal teams because it's a Microsoft owned and managed framework. Um, so I love that personally about Microsoft. Um, as a developer, I've used a variety of languages and stacks and technologies and frameworks, so I appreciate that. But what can I do? So what is .NET MAUI? First of all, .NET MAUI stands for Multi-Platform App UI. Um, we thought it was a super cool name when we when we thought it up. We're like, oh, it's going to be great. We're all going to have flowers on our shirts, and we're all going to go to Maui for a big, you know, release party. And then somebody got sick and 
shared it with everybody else, and then we all got stuck. Um, and then we had to capitalize it, which was a real drag, because that wasn't what we intended at all. Um, but whatever, it is what it is. The .NET is the most important part. But our goal here really is to make it the most productive way to develop native apps, whether you're working on one platform or many. Um, it can, it should be just one simple decision because uh, probably the coolest thing, in my opinion, about Xamarin itself and now .NET MAUI is that uh, you can build your app in it. Xamarin Forms is now seven plus years old and people are still running the same apps from way back. That's seven years of iOS releases, Android releases, Mac OS and Windows releases, and they haven't had to rewrite their app, right? And they can run on the latest stuff with the latest features of that platform. That's what we do. Um, so when you choose .NET MAUI, and then Windows comes out with a new thing, Windows App SDK, you've never heard of it? Okay, we can, we can talk about that. But it has cool new features in it, and you can totally use them, and you don't have to rewrite anything. You say, well, that doesn't work for me. Well, I, I really need WPF because it has further reach back. We can add WPF, and you don't have to rewrite your app. Um, WPF isn't currently something we support in Maui, but it's supported in Xamarin Forms, and we have customers that do that with large financial apps. Um, that's one of the really cool things. I like to call it future proof. Um, so that's one thing it takes care of for you. All right. This is the uh, Weather 21 app that uh, I helped design and build. Uh, this is running on Mac, Windows, nope, Mac, Windows, uh, <laughs> iOS, and Android, right? Um, and uh, you can see that it's a consistent UI across all the platforms. So 4.8 or better is what we encourage. Um, the closer you can get to five, which is the latest release, is uh, is the best. But 4.8 is kind of just uh, Sweeky and, and Maddie who work on the migration assistant, which uh, if you have older code bases in .NET and you're like, how do I get these things up to .NET 5, .NET 6? We've got a great tool called the .NET Upgrade Assistant. It's a CLI-based tool, but it will do a bunch of the work for you. Um, and so we're using that to bring Xamarin apps to .NET 6 and .NET MAUI. Um, and so we still have some things to work through, but yeah, that's where they drew the minimum. And uh, good question. Uh, that is available actually up on GitHub now. You can go download it and try it um, and let Sweeky know what she broke and she will fix it because Sweeky's awesome. Um, but yeah, so this, this is a great app. It you know, resizes to the desktop. Um, we currently are in a preview cycle where uh, we broke the layout. So this looks better than what you would get if you downloaded it right today. But we are at preview eight right now. And uh, I'll show the timeline here in a little bit. We've got several previews to go before we GA. So uh, the good news is, is that we broke the layouts because we happen to have made them better and faster. Um, some might say that we made them so good, they broke. So how does this actually work, right? So what you care most about is your app code. And this is where you want to spend your time. This is where you're going to be most productive. This is where you're implementing your features, your UI, et cetera. And you want to do this once for all those platforms. But you know, how does that actually get there? So we need to have SDKs for each native platform. So of course, we have the, the Google Android SDK, Apple's Xcode, which carries all of their SDKs. Uh, including Mac OS, and then of course Windows, which uh, ships with Windows itself, but then also we have the WinUI Toolkit and Windows App SDK. Do you want to learn four different uh, SDKs and four different languages, or th at least three different languages? You can share, I guess, iOS and Mac OS. Of course not. So what needs to happen to get your app code written in C Sharp and or XAML and or HTML and Razor um, to those platforms? So we need a runtime that's going to take our .NET and make it do its thing. We need a base class library, which is the API that does all the things that is going to run inside of that runtime. And then we have projections, essentially, or we call them bindings for .NET for Android, .NET for iOS and Mac Catalyst, and then WinUI itself, which we don't need a binding for, but we do need to enable it for .NET because 
actually Windows App SDK and WinUI are a C++ uh, framework. So we, uh, we work with them to make it work with .NET. So when you use .NET for Android or when your app code runs on Android, it's actually using the exact same Android SDK that you would have used if you had written your app in Java or Kotlin, but you're using .NET to do it. And we do the same thing for all the other platforms. And so the way in which your app code can do this once and run everywhere is using the .NET MAUI uh, SDK or the toolkit. So when you say, give me a MAUI button, then it's going to go to Android and say, okay, give me a button widget. It's going to go to iOS and Catalyst and say, okay, render a UI button. Uh, and then on WinUI, it's going to give you a WinUI 3 button. And uh, you can style it as you need to. And that styling and behavior can be platform specific or it can be consistent. Um, so we, we hear mostly from customers that they prefer consistency. Um, this is not the case seven years ago when Xamarin Forms was first created. And this is another example of how the platform helps you span not just SDKs that are released, but span trends in the market. So the, the trend back then was that your Android app looked like an Android app, your iOS app looked like an iOS app, and if they ever crossed the streams, who knew what was going to happen? Because, you know, you get an Android user that loads up an iOS-looking thing on their phone, they're going to flip out, right? It's like, oh, I'll get this Steve Jobs thing off my phone. Um, so back in the day, that's how Xamarin Forms worked. Well, now uh, customers and trends in the market are like, that's not what they want. We've created a brand identity. We've got design, usually one design from your designer or the design that you bought off of the web. And that's what you're using, right? And uh, there's not an iOS version and an Android version. So that's, what, that's a lot of what Maui does for you. But we hope that you don't ever need to worry about those other layers because the only things that you really need to worry about are your app code working with .NET Maui. The good news is, is that you can still, from your app code, go straight into the Android SDK and do what you need to do. So if Maui doesn't have exactly what you want because it's very specific to that platform, you can just write a little bit of Android code and you're done. Um, and it doesn't, and it uh, doesn't have to be a lot of code either. In Xamarin Forms, it was actually like three different classes to do a custom renderer. Now in .NET MAUI, it's just a couple lines. So that's pretty sweet. So what else do you have here? You've got a rich set of controls, a bunch of different adaptive layouts. Uh, and this stuff's pretty battle-tested. You know, It's been around for quite a while. And we're working uh, between now and GA on polishing and cleaning up the quality of it. Apparently I have extra slides or I'm going backwards. Uh, tons of third party component vendors. Uh, they are already on board, most of these. Uh, and some of them are already shipping .NET 6, .NET MAUI compatible libraries. So that's really nice and encouraging. In particular, when it comes to desktop development, because um, you know, Xamarin Forms and Xamarin itself being primarily mobile focused, we don't really have a ton of desktop focused controls, um, but our partners do. So that pesky little tree view you keep asking me for, pick one, um, data grid. Uh, I've been asked about a data grid three, four times in the past like two weeks. So we have a collection view and a collection view will do a lot of things that data grid does. Um, but I know that data grids can get super crazy. Uh, so partners have data grids. How do you build your code uh, like this? So of course, you've got the same stuff you would have used in Xamarin. You have your XAML, you have your C-sharp, and as I mentioned before, the XAML is completely optional. You don't have to use it. Uh, we also have CSS. You can style it with CSS instead of XAML if you want. Uh, and it actually supports preprocessors like SAS and LESS. Uh, in terms of styling, pretty much anything you need to do, you can totally do. Uh, some of my favorites uh, is support for custom fonts and font icons. We've made that super easy to do. Um, so if you have some vectors, some SVGs, you want to bundle those up into a, um, into a font, you can use them that way. And then, of course, we have full support for light and dark mode. Um, and then uh, I'll show this in just a little bit, I think. I have another slide on this. But in terms of productivity, you used to have to provide images and resources in the platform-specific sizes, You know, all the DPIs for Android, all the different sizes for iOS. Well, now you can supply one PNG or SVG 
and Maui will render those things out for you. And we give you control to say, hey, I need it to be at max this size, or here's my base size, and uh, it will respect that, and at build time, generate those assets for you. So saves you a ton of time and effort, uh, saves me a ton of time and effort. I don't ever want to go back. Uh, even though I know how to use design tools, and I can pump out some stuff from Sketch or Figma. Um, this is a little bit of that. Uh, I was describing how easy it is to get into the native platform. So uh, a canonical example that I like to use is if you need to customize the entry field on an Android. Um, how many of you carry Android? All right, several Android. So uh, you know the typical way an Android entry field looks is you have the underline, and then you have the label, which moves from the center position or the placeholder position up to a label at the top, right? Well. If your design doesn't call for that, then it's super annoying to see that underline because it's very material, um, material design. And so how do you get rid of that thing? Well, there's no API for it in Maui or Xamarin Forms itself because it is very Android specific. But if you want to do it, all you have to do is override the entry mapper. Uh, basically, we get, a, we get a bag of properties and we get a bag of implementations and we map them. And so if you want to override that, all you do is add this little bit of code right in your in your app anywhere. Put it anywhere. As long as that code gets called, it's going to do its thing. And then you can hide that. So the if def is the .NET pattern for uh, the ability to multi-target with compiler option. Um, and we used to do this back in the day with Flex, didn't we? So much of this stuff, I'm just like, oh, it's like a throwback. Um, and you can do it this way. This is not the only way to do uh, multi-targeting in .NET. You can do it by file name, by file extension, et cetera. You access the handler from anywhere in your code that gets run. You tell it the property that you want to override. And we actually now, uh, I saw this just like a couple weeks ago, so I need to update these slides, but we now have like two or three new methods that allow you to either extend an existing implementation or to uh, override it directly. Um, and you can pre and post hook into it. So it's pretty cool stuff. We've, we've got some really neat helper methods that we need to document um, and get that stuff out there. Uh, in terms of uh, going beyond what you have today, we have a experimental library called Maui Graphics Controls. And what this does is it takes Skia and it takes the native uh, graphics engines and it draws the controls. So this way, there's really no pixel you can't control and make completely consistent across platforms. We also have the notion of hybrid controls. So for example, uh, entry on Android, as we just talked about, has some very specific behaviors. Well, what if you just want to control the look of it, you want to skin it, but you want to keep it behaving the way it behaves uh, and keep the accessibility properties and the localization and all that sort of thing? Well, you can use this library and you can use the hybrid entry control, and that allows you to control all the pixels that get drawn no matter where it gets drawn, but still use basically a naked entry control behind the scenes. Um, so you retain all the behavior of the native platform while controlling the UI. So uh, if you are familiar with other frameworks that rhyme with butter, um, then this will be familiar to you. And uh, yeah, it's drawing all the pixels. So we're very excited about this because it allows customers to achieve that design consistency that they ask for. Um, and it also actually performs better. Um, we don't have to use Skia. It's a fallback, actually, because we use the native graphics engines on each platform. So you don't pay the penalty of bringing along the Skia SDK or the library every time you, you bundle. So cool stuff like that. Um, I want to highlight some of the project improvements. When are you going to kick me off, by the way? You, you can pull a plug. I'll just keep going. Are people in the chat board? party. I didn't see beer. What's going on? <laughs> um, I wanted to highlight a couple of other cool productivity things. Um, and I've got billions of slides, so I'm not going to make you sit here and watch all the slides. Um, like I said, I apologize. I can't run code for you right now. I do actually have my Mac. My Mac actually runs. I borked my Windows machine. Um, but single project. So this is really cool because uh, previously, when you're targeting multi -plat multiple platforms, you had to have separate projects for each platform you're targeting, and you would have to have separate NuGets uh, libraries for each of them, and so you're duplicating a lot of that work. 
you're also duplicating your font registration, you're duplicating all your image assets and all kinds of unsavory things. Um, so what we've done is we said, let's simplify this. That's a whole lot simpler, right? I mean, it's a much smaller picture. So, uh, but yeah, we consolidated it and we're like, hey, let's use .NET multi-targeting and let's use the project system updates in .NET 6 and let's make this whole thing better. So in one place, you can put all this stuff and it just works. Um, I mean, it really just works. It's pretty awesome. Uh, so let's see, other things. Yeah, this is the other pattern for doing multi-targeting that I talked about. You can and you can tell your CS proj, hey, every time I do a dot Android dot CS, compile that for Android and ignore it for everything else. Um, you can put all your fonts in one place and it will automatically pick them up. That's all you gotta do. Just drop them in there and then you can just start using them. And uh, in order to actually target from here, we have updated the run menu button, the F5 button, if you will, um, so that it's aware of all the different platforms your project supports and all your devices and or emulators and or target platforms are selectable right from there. Um, so you don't have to go switching a bunch of things around. You just pick what you're trying to run for and you're off to the races. Uh, let's see, what else can we talk about real quick? Hot reload both for XAML and C Sharp now in .NET 6. So that's really, shall we say, hot. Um, it's super productive. If you spend any amount of time, not just on UI, but also on like view models, um, intermediate code, things like that, you can very easily update those things and see your changes without recompiling. Uh, you can work directly to iOS from Windows, no Mac involved. Isn't that bananas, right? Um, so you use the IDE that you might prefer, and you can target any iOS device. Uh, we also, though, do have the remote iOS simulator. This has been around for quite a while. You do need a Mac for this. Um, so this is, uh, but this is also helpful, especially if you have a touchscreen display like this Dell XPS, you can pull up your iOS remote simulator and touch it. Um, it's pretty awesome. Let's see, more ways. Uh, essentials, so there's a lot of non-UI things that you need to be able to do, right? Like uh, touch the accelerometer and get telemetry from that, access the clipboard, touch a batter, which I think is missing a Y. Somebody needs to proofread these things. Oh, speaking of proofreading, Visual Studio 2022 now has uh, spell check, <laughs> right? I, you, you laugh, but it's like it's there. I didn't know that it never spell checked. Um, Blazor Hybrid is something that we're really excited about too, or I'm very excited about it. And we've seen a lot of uh, developers investigating this. And so this is the ability to take a uh, Blazor web view control and any Blazor app, wh whether it's WebAssembly or server-based, whatever, and you can drop it right into a MAUI application and you have shared state, shared debugging, all the hot reload works across it, no matter whether you are touching native UI with C-sharp and XAML, or your UI is in Razor files. Um, and it all works seamlessly together. It's really cool. And the reason it works seamlessly, like I had to have Alon Lipton, the engineer, explain this to me because I'm just like, no, you, you gotta be kidding me. This can't work this well. Um, he's like, it's it's just all .NET at the, at the compile. And so it, it just all gets, it's like your peas and uh, mashed potatoes. Like once it's in your mouth, it's like, it's all the same, right? You don't, you don't like that one? That was good. This is what you paid for. You didn't, you didn't pay anything. Um, but no, seriously, I mean, it's just like super seamless. So hybrid, of course, if you've been around for any number of years and judging from the gray hairs in the room or the lack of hair, sorry, um, you've been around for a while. <laughs> I'm gonna get booed off. <laughs> um, that, you know, the hybrid has had some rough times, right? Um, typically means uncanny valley, typically means um, very hard to uh, debug and troubleshoot, et cetera. Um, but in this case, because of the seamless blending of all .NET things, uh, I think it's a really a new, it's a new thing. Um, so interested to see how customers use it. And frankly, it wasn't that hard to do. And so when something is not that hard to do and support, we get it out there and see what customers actually want to use it for. Um, I mentioned the Maui graphics. I'm not going to do that. Let me see, where are my slides? Let's go to the close. 
So I did want to highlight some of the cool new things coming in Visual Studio 2022. Um, .NET 6 ships in Visual Studio 2022, so you got to have it. Um, you know, community version is free. You can do side-by-side -side installs, so you don't have to worry about uh, messing up your production environment. Um, IntelliCode, using the cloud AI stuff, is improved. Live preview is really cool, and this is what I wanted to demo. Unfortunately, I can't. Um, is you can basically mirror your application directly inside Visual Studio now. So it looks very much, if you've played with, uh, JP you probably have, the Swift UI stuff, right? Like the ability to see your UI right there in the IDE and touch it um, and get information about it, but also drag and drop onto it. We're not doing the drag and drop part, but the ability to inspect, the ability to set up uh, UI grids, the ability to zoom in, um, all from a live running app. It's pretty cool. And it all works with both XAML and .NET, C Sharp Hot Reload, all at the same time. Um, it's a super powerful experience. And it's taken us a while to get here. Five years ago, I was like, where's our Hot Reload? We need some Hot Reload. And uh, everybody was saying it. And then we finally have it. So that's really cool. Um, Live Visual Tree, basically your UI inspector. I mentioned the iOS dev on Windows. Um, set your calendars. Set your reminders. .NET Conf, all virtual event, November 9th, 10th, and 11th. Um, I think the 10th and 11th, or maybe just the 11th, uh, are com all community days. Um, the 9th is going to be all first party presentations about .NET 6. Here it is. Here's all the cool things it does. Um, with actual demos, you can enjoy as opposed to just hearing me talk. Um, it is free, so be sure to be there. I'm sure they'll have giveaways and stuff like that too. They always do fun stuff if you're into swag. Um, but please do join that. We will be talking about where things stand with .NET MAUI at that time. So in terms of upcoming dates, that is what's happening in November. .NET 6 will be GA. At that time, we're going to call .NET MAUI still preview. Even though it is part of .NET 6, uh, as we were assessing the readiness for actual customers to use, we're like, it's not there yet. We're not happy with it. Customers aren't going to be happy with it. So let's spend some extra time up in the quality, up in the performance, um, polishing things up. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, from December to Q1 2022, we will be doing monthly previews. They will ship with um, .NET 6 service releases uh, is the plan. We're still working that out. You may think that we have everything figured out ahead of time, but we just have really smart people that figure things out on the fly. So that's mostly what happens. Although we have lots, we have, I tell you what, it's really cool to sit in meetings. Sorry, I'm like off screen. Uh, it is really cool to sit in meetings with people that have been around for 20 years at Microsoft because they're like, oh, yeah, that reminds me of such and such time when we did this, and that was a really bad idea, so we learned from that. So we're not going to do that again. Um, and, and, you know, some of these stories are just like, wow, I think I was, like, in diapers at the time, but that was really cool, although I'm 47, so technically I was only 27, 20 years ago. Um, so we will have an RC in Q1, and then we will have a GA sometime in Q2 of .NET MAUI. Um, my expectation is basically this, that come November, MAUI for mobile and desktop development. Uh, and this is why we didn't like just say, let's just ship it in November. Because to explain some of these ins and outs is just, and this isn't even all the detail, this is just the high level. Um, it would have been hard, right? So like we haven't shipped the VS Mac 2022 yet. So that needs to come out. We're currently rewriting it. Uh, pulling out the GDK UI, uh, implementing the .NET 6-based UI, um, because they're all using our stuff. They're using the old Xamarin Mac, which is now .NET 6 Mac. Like, they are our customer. Um, so we need to make sure that stuff's all there and working, because we are a multi-platform toolkit, so we kind of need a Mac at some point, even though you can get away without the Mac for a long time. Uh, the controls and the layouts, we, we expect those to actually be pretty feature complete come November. Um, maybe one or two missing properties, except for the incomplete stuff in the list over there. Um, but, uh, you know, it's mostly just going to be quality stuff at that point. So it's like use at your own risk, right? Um, but I will certainly be encouraging people more and more as time goes on to bang on this stuff. Uh, and then, of course, uh, performance and quality, you know, we, we always have an eye on it. Um, but it's not going to be where we want it to be yet in November. And so we need to do that trimming work. Trimming is um, the IL linking where we go in and look at the assemblies and say, what are you actually using? What are you not using? And we rip out the stuff you're not using 
so that your packages get smaller and your code performs better. And then come Q2, everything will be green. Everybody will be hugging. There will be high fives. We might actually be able to get to Maui Island. Um, so that'd be very cool. So with that, droned on for long enough. Actually, it wasn't too long. It wasn't too bad. Um, but I wanted to you know, set, set aside time for some questions. Um, I do have some running bits on my Mac, which I can't plug into all this stuff, and I probably can't show to the whole world on a live stream. But uh, I could at least show to a few people here. Sorry, not, not to, uh, I don't know what the word I'm looking for, not to penalize you for not coming out in person. Are there any questions in the chat or any questions here? Things you want to know, either from the presentation or otherwise? So uh, that is something that I didn't cover. So of course you can access the native camera APIs. Um, and if you've ever written a camera app, which I've written probably five, um, then you know it's it's a lot of copy and paste from one project to another, and it's a lot of same same rigmarole. Um, in the Xamarin Community Toolkit, which will be coming to the .NET Maui Toolkit, which actually is also merged with the Windows Toolkit team because we have infrastructure there for documentation for. CI builds and things like that. There is a camera control. Um, so it is a cross platform camera control. I don't know what the coverage is in terms of all the platforms it supports, um, but that will be coming to the .NET MAUI toolkit. Um, yeah, so that's more of a drop in. Hey, here's your camera. Yeah. So Probably the best advice I can give you is to look at Shiny. Um, Shiny is a good library that does some background management for you. Uh, Alan Ritchie has done tons of background work in the past. And so I think Shiny has some support for that. Oh yeah, the question, uh, sorry, for the audience at home. Uh, the question was about uh, iOS background processes and has that gotten any better essentially, right? Um, so of course, again, like the camera, uh, you can you can go do all the stuff you need to do um, by yourself, and you know make sure you set your bill rate where it needs to be for that. Um, but yeah, so I would look at Shiny. It's not something that we currently have um, on our roadmap to improve upon, but we do have the Essentials APIs, which are all baked in, and that's essentially where that sort of thing would live. Um, how do you marshal background, foreground, and um, we're actually yeah, we're building an app for .NET Comp for our demo that is going to utilize some background services, and that will be open source. So we'll, we'll see how that looks. It might provide some help. Yeah. What is Skia? Oh, fantastic. So Skia is a library from Google for uh, pixels, uh, drawing. It's a drawing engine. Um, so it is what Flutter uses, the aforementioned Butter just for anybody that was missing that. You know, JP, something I like to do in presentations at Microsoft is uh, threaten to drop the F-bomb and then say flash. <laughs> Good times. Um, yeah, so it is, it is a library that Google uh, releases. And so we have our own version called Skia Sharp, which is a .NET binding to that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's all primitives, vector-based stuff. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm saying that we need to convince them to do so. Um, we, we certainly have plenty of executive uh, connections talking to those in, uh, what is their organization called? I don't know, the office team, um, to see where they want to take things. Um, because, I mean, they suffer from the same problems that all other Electron apps do. Very big flagship Flagship apps being built in Maui. Uh, I certainly know of some flagship apps from other companies. Um, we do have some internal teams that we have talked to, and I can't name those, sorry. Um, but you would recognize them. Um, we do have some internal teams that have reached out and said, hey, you know, we're very interested in doing this. We've got, you know, maybe we have an old code base that is WinForm. And it's time, it's high time to upgrade and, and modernize. Um, and so we're talking to them, making sure that it's the right fit, and of course, unblocking them where they need to be unblocked. But um, 
I, I, I would be super thrilled, but also extremely surprised if in this time frame we would see something like, you know, an office product suddenly taking it on. I mean, let's be realistic. It's um, we need to ship it first. Um, and then uh, is it the right thing for them? And we already know that, like I said, they're typically using a mix of, of React Web, React Native, um, C++, and .NET. So uh, it's not a one size fits all thing, but we'll certainly win any big internals that we can. It's hard though to explain to customers who are like, give me that flagship app, you know, um, because if, if you're not using it, then how can we trust it? It's like, well, our customer is primarily you outside of Microsoft. Our customer is not primarily Microsoft team. So, yeah, so the question is about um, what is the what is the real story with building for iOS from a Windows machine? That's what you're asking, right? Um, so, no, it, you don't need another machine. Um, this is for your day-to-day -day development productivity. 